Hello, it's uh, Paul Beckwith again, and uh, in this video, I'm just going to uh, finish up on my discussion on tipping elements in the climate system um, that have been discussed in a review paper that uh, has just come out in the last few weeks. So this is a uh, key um, chart that is in the paper, and it discusses uh, a bunch of different tipping elements and tries to classify them in terms of, uh, you know, how long they take to occur and how long they take to initiate and whether or not they're irreversible. So I'm going to talk about the one that's not so well known here, stratocumulus cloud deck evaporation. Okay, so this is a schematic here. This is uh, in the tropics, mostly, okay, temperatures you know, if they're 300 Kelvin, this is uh, uh, zero Kelvin is minus 27, or, or um, zero Kelvin is minus 273 Celsius. Okay, so this is about 27 degrees Celsius, subtropical temperatures about 17. And as we get warming, as we warm the land on the surface, we can have, get, we can run into problems with the stratospheric cloud. So, Here's we here here's it so this is near the equator in the tropics so this is a column of air we get uh, a lot of water vapor produced from evaporation on the surface of the ocean that water vapor climbs up and condenses into these clouds and we get this column of clouds okay so we get this sort of thing this is what we have now at about 400 ppm we've got the solar insulation coming down and some of it's reflected off of these clouds and some of it goes into the ocean and heats the ocean so so um, the ocean heat can can be released but also there's a lot of evaporation which brings heat upward and that water moist that water vapor rises it reaches the colder air it condenses and it forms these layers of clouds so typical heights 1.27 kilometers high and the height of the cloud deck can be about 370 meters typically and there's a lot of moisture entrained here and the top of the clouds are very very cold because you get long wave uh, cooling and that takes heat away from the top of the cloud so because of that temperature difference warm very warm here cold at the top you get these sort of clouds which then uh, reflect a lot of the sunlight keeping it relatively cool now the problem is is that as the co2 level increases and it has to increase fairly substantially according to this um, according to, to the, to, to the uh, work done so far but as, as you get higher levels of co2 the surface is warmer so you get more evaporation and the whole atmosphere is warmer warming as you go up so so the uh, the cloud decks are formed lower so we got a, a typical height of 970 meters with a thickness of 350 meters okay so the thickness of the cloud is reduced and they're lower level clouds so it's not as cold at the surface at the top of the clouds so the long wave cooling is reduced it's 62 watts per meter squared modeled here at 1200 ppm down from 74 here now as you go slightly higher another 100 parts per million the, the clouds, there's not enough uh, water vapor coming up forming these clouds because the height is lower, the height of the clouds uh, increases in this case, but you don't have a cloud deck anymore, you have cumulus clouds. So instead of stratocumulus covering, you know, and a large cloud covering the oceans and a loud, large cloud fraction um, emitting a lot of, um, reflecting a lot of incoming sunlight, you get these more sparse cumulus clouds, not reflecting as much sunlight. So you get a lot more sunlight reaching the surface of the earth. You get a lot more evaporation of the ocean water and a lot, so the cloud fraction is greatly reduced and you get a tremendous heating. Okay, so you get a disintegration of the stratocumulus layer. You get acute surface warming from increased absorption of sunlight, and you can get a very, very large temperature rise. I think the models have even up to eight degrees Celsius temperature rise. So uh, hopefully 
the, uh, this effect does not kick in uh, before we get to these sort of levels. But, you know, it's something that is to be monitored very carefully. Okay, uh, of course, we have coral reef habitat and Amazon rainforest dieback and all of these other effects coming into play as well. So we'll just continue down here. So the, here's the Amazon rainforest. So basically, the rain comes in. You know, um, it rains on the system. There's evapotranspiration from the leaves that brings moisture back up into the atmosphere, forming clouds, and then it can fall again. So you can get it cycling through the rainforest, you know, five or six times or more. So as you reduce the water cycle, as you get less and less um, rainforest, as you do more clearing and uh, conversion of the rainforest to uh, farming and ranching, etc., you weaken this water cycle. So you can get a very, very high frequency of fires and um, you get, uh, you know, with loss of rainfall, you get, you start losing the forest. Okay, so here, here's a for so you often get years of drought. So you get mortality of the large trees increasing due to drought that reduces the forest cover. There's less water vapor going up, so it reduces the whole water cycle. Um, you get carbon release from the biomass, you get a wildfire frequencies increasing. And so not only are you, are, so when you do the deforestation and when you get the drought years, it stresses the rainforest. Okay, that cycling of water repeatedly through slows down and can even stop. And then the trees will not grow back. You get um, grasslands growing because the water Precipitation rates are much lower. They're no longer able to support a rainforest. So you can get savannas where you get grasslands and interspersed trees. Eventually, you know, it gets drier and drier and you just get grasslands and you lose your agricultural productivity. So you basically you get a tipping from the rainforest into grass savanna and grasslands. So basically, all of the different tipping elements were looked at in great detail in this paper. They looked at the current uh, research and then they came up with, uh, you know, this chart here showing the AMOC weakening collapse here, moderate level of scientific understanding, predictability by models, the models in good agreement, some limitations, key thresholds uncertain, and they concluded collapse unlikely but weakening causes regional cooling, wind, precipitation, sea level change, and the time scale weakening over centuries, but the collapse would be abrupt, so over decades or so, but, but low risk of happening um, in, the, in our immediate future, according to the most recent science. They have methane hydrate destabilization as a moderate risk or moderate level of scientific understanding low probability, low predictability from the models. Um, they think that, uh, you know, it's not likely to be so much a problem until temperatures go beyond three Celsius above pre-industrial. Um, you know, there's long-term release of methane. The question is how long does it take? And, uh, you know, according to this, I mean, this is the release is slow. The risk isn't so great. Like I say, these I don't, uh, I'm, I'm showing the results from this paper. I'm not uh, saying that I agree with a lot of these things. Of course, Greenland and Antarctic ice sheet melt, moderate to high um, scientific understanding, moderate predictability. Greenland, two degrees Celsius threshold, West Antarctic, two to three degrees. And there was a recent paper coming that came out that shows that the sea level rise is much expected to be much worse than um, what scientists have been expecting up to that up to now no surprise there you know it looks at permafrost carbon release boreal forest shifts this is the stratocumulus cloud deck evaporation so low scientific understanding low risk you know needed 1200 ppm co2 equivalent to be triggered but it would cause worldwide marine cloud deck breakup that would trigger warming of up to eight degrees Celsius. 
And that could be very abrupt with the impacts within a decade. So if this threshold was triggered within a decade, you could get this huge warming. And it's well worth looking, you know, considering, you know, how this occurred in the past in some of these abrupt changes in the past. Of course, coral reef habitat collapse is ongoing now. Severe impacts beyond 1.5, which is essentially where we are, critical threshold at two. You know, we're likely to lose 99% of warm water coral habitats worldwide. And of course, the, the impact on cascading into other things is, is um, not really known so much. Um, Amazon rainforest dieback, it's, it's uh, you know, also occurring on a rapid basis. You know, when you get this, uh, a certain percent of, percentage of deforestation of the whole region, um, then you can get a complete collapse, a complete die off of the system, you know, very strong threshold effect. And then we have the monsoon effects, summer sea ice effects, and uh, the idea is that, you know, you can get a cascade, a tipping point cascade. So, you know, low, low scientific understanding, um, but, you know, interacting climate tipping points can occur. And I showed you, um, okay, so this plot here shows low impacts to high impacts and time scale, a thousand years, a hundred years, decades. You know, we have a uh, coral reef in, mortality here, Arctic sea ice happening sort of now, Amazon dieback, boreal forest, permafrost thaw, thaw AMOC slowdown, ice sheet melts, methane hydrates here, and, and here the cloud deck evaporation. You know, consider, you know, this could be an enormous effect, but it looks like you need higher CO2 levels for it to happen, although there's, there's very little research that's being done on this. So this is something to uh, find out a lot more about. Okay, so, so basically, um, basically what this paper has done, um, just to, to review, so, so basically in 2007, there's this paper, Tipping Elements in the Earth's Climate System. It's an excellent paper. It's the first paper to look at um, when you want to assess different tipping points, and there's a map here of various tipping elements, and then there's a chart showing the different elements and what is expected in terms of time scales of transition, the warming required, the impacts if it happens, etc. Okay, so that's sort of the key landmark paper. And then just recently, the Breakthrough Institute came out with this paper, which you can also just uh, put in the title into Google and find the paper and have a look at it yourself. But Earth System Dynamics, Mechanisms, Evidence, and Impacts of Climate Tipping Elements. And there's lots of papers, you know, it basically does a review of the most recent papers on each of these different topics that are shown here and tries to assess the risk of them happening, how quickly they will tip from one state to another state once it's initiated, how long it takes to be initiated, and also brings in the idea of cascading feedbacks. Um, so basically with climate change, we're, we're playing with fire. You know, as we continue to emit fossil fuels and continue to, uh, you know, live in a way such that we're changing uh, rapidly the chemistry of our atmosphere and oceans, we're subjecting ourselves to these enormous risks of tipping the system over into a state which we cannot get back out of, an irreversible state. So anyway, thank you for listening to this video series. And, uh, you know, like I said before, I hope everybody is staying safe. And uh, please check out my website if you haven't, paulbeckwith.net and uh, consider donating to my PayPal to support my research on, on these videos. Thanks again. Bye for now.